Oh, you could just move with a bit, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna put it lower. Mm. I suppose if you want to put it in a kind of grandiose way, it's, it's a bit like saying, you know, how do you find an ethic after destruction? Telling big stories through individual human lives is a very powerful sort of way of doing history. Now, objectivity is not an equidistant position between any two points, which is what always bothers me about once you start talking about objectivity. I, I kind of came through a cultural studies arc, and I'm still, I'm still very interested in theory, but in a sense, I think human lives, if you obviously got to pick the right lives and so on, but they are more complex than any theory. I remember just being overwhelmed by the sense they hadn't won, the Republic had not won, and how could that possibly be? And so it was just this idea that, well, you can't win the war for them, but if you can, if you can just, you could, you know, very usefully spend your life explaining in, in, in great kind of complex detail exactly why they didn't. So it was that, it was the, it was the topic. I mean, Paul Preston was a great teacher. He, was, he taught me as an undergraduate. Um, European history, not specifically Spain, or at least I think a bit later Spain, but, uh, but it wasn't mentors or particular people, it was the topic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I can't think it was that it, was, it wasn't a particular book, it just was something about... Um, well, I suppose, you know, 30 years on, I now say, you know, the Spanish Civil War is the war, when the, the, the war before the lights went out, the war that could perhaps have, you know, changed the course of European and world history if, you know, power actors had... had behaved in different ways and so that's probably part of its fascination but also the fact that it, uh, it was this kind of transformational site sort of culturally for so many different kinds of people. So it is a bit of a magic territory really. The idea is that it's a bit like sort of dealing with the Holocaust, that uh, people want to kind of explain it into submission, um, so that kind of it's all going to be all right. You know, there's a kind of assimilation of defeat and terrible things, and, and you move on from them. Well, in a sense, I think the Spanish Civil War is another subject like that, where you have to say, well, no, you can't, the, the, you know, there's some things you can't assimilate, but you just have to live with the, the, the kind of the, the negatives. So it's a kind of it's a kind of philosophical sort of pursuit as well, sort of thing. But, but anyway, these lives are basically a way of talking about how people live with uh, a world that's not perfect and that's very different to the one they wanted to, to be creating. There is a sense of um, what I call the plenty phenomenon, which is that um, there's, a, there's a play by uh, David Herr, which is about um, how people. I mean, the specifics don't matter, it's actually about the Second World War, but it's talking about how people who've lived very intensely at the pitch of, of kind of the edge of, of uh, you know, a much more intense life, whether they were about, whether it was living with tremendous risks about possibly, you know, dying from one day to the next or, or whatever, but it's that intensity. And people who've had that experience can never come down from it. And sort of, I mean, the, the, the ambiguity of the title, it's, it's a kind of irony, the title plenty, the plenty of, uh, of the post-war is against the austerity of the war, but it's the opposite for them. They, they see the war as when, they, when it was really rich and plentiful and, and the post-war is, is kind of, is, is threadbare. And there is a sense of, uh, in the lives of some of these people, that even though the war was, for some of them, painful experience and difficult, it was, it was when they were most alive. One of the things I was very keen to do in that book was to kind of talk about communism as a social movement because I'm, I'm as one of my kind of soapbox subjects that's well students and indeed the general public I mean and it, it seems to have got worse after 1989 that people don't understand that it was a social movement it's kind of there's this notion of ideology and it being kind of you know it, kind of brain, almost this, well, ridiculous idea of brainwashing people. And so, particularly in a European context, you really have to start from the point of view that this was a mass social movement that embraced, you know, millions of people, and it's about the whole of their lives and what it meant to them culturally and so, and so on and so forth. So in a sense, in that book, I did, when talking about it, tried to kind of talk about what that meant. <laughs> ¶¶
it's always occurred to me that in a, in an Ameri a North American context, or a US context, the Spanish Civil War punches above its weight because it's really not about the Spanish Civil War, it's about getting the Lincolns, you know, and therefore it's about post-1945 American history. It's not really about Spain, because of course one, my big bugbear with people like Ray Dosh uh, and others is that they don't know anything about the Spanish Civil War. They don't, I mean, basically it's, a, it's an imperialist take on the conflict. It's basically, Spain doesn't exist until the great powers inscribe a meaning on the, on the face of Spain, which is, you know, is, is clearly going to annoy anybody who spent 20 odd years of their life working on you know, all of the other debates and, and, and issues that were actually there in Spain to start with. <laughs> Because in a sense, the, the, the whole explosion of um, historical memory, it's always in the singular, it should be the plural, but anyway, all of that, um, and the involvement of journalists and so on and so forth, I mean, journalists can be doing all sorts of things, good, bad and indifferent, but I mean, that whole kind of public sphere memory issue is obviously, it seems to me, part of the democratic transition, because it is, I mean, in a sense, we have to understand historically that what happened in the 1970s and up to the, you know, 75 to 1980 or whatever, 82, when the Pasoy came to power, was basically, a, you know, a superstructural um, transition from, you know, a dictatorship to a parliamentary regime but in an odd way it blocked because of the particular way in the transition was negotiated it blocked out although there was lots of mobilization on the streets in the in the, in the 70s in, in a sense the transition was negotiated from the top and in a sense there were you know that the, there was just a complete block on on obviously for for reasons of, of stability and what was going on in the army not talking about anything that had gone on and really it wasn't a terribly democratic process <laughs> so in a sense this is this this is this is now that, that kind of opening up and talking about all of this. But also it seems to me that not everybody has to agree. I mean, there, it, it's another Franco effect, this, 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 this idea that if we don't have a single view of the past, it's going to be chaos come again, I'm going to have another civil war, and it's all, we're all going to hell in the bucket, blah, blah, blah. That seems to me is also a Franco, a Franco effect. I mean, the, coming through and out the other end is coming to a point when you understand that we don't, Always, we don't all have to have the same view of the past and it will all be all right. I mean, I think, in a sense, that's why I'm interested in history, because I do think history is this kind of superior discipline because it is the ultimate antidote to any kind of oversimplification. You know, as soon as somebody says, that's always the way that should be, you can say, ah, but it wasn't like that in X time or whatever. So history, it seems to me, is the, the perfect sort of immunisation against thinking in binary, simplistic categories. But I do think that... Uh Ha ha ha!